I haven't made a little video in a while. I was working on um, applied probability and statistics. But let me just get straight to the point. I took my objective assessment and I passed by a pretty comfortable margin. Um, I'm trying to be kind of discreet about when I took the test and what these scores exactly look like, mostly for personal reasons, but as you can see in the fraction, fractions, decimals, and percentages, exemplary, basic algebra, algebra exemplary, descriptive statistics for single value, variable exemplary, descriptive statistics for two variables exemplary, uh, correlation and regression competent, and then probability competent. So I'm just going to kind of break down my assessment of this assessment, and then I can kind of go into my notes. So overall, I felt like the performance, the pre-assessment and the objective assessment aligned well. I felt pretty confident after taking the PA that I would pass the OA, um, and I passed the PA with honestly, I think a little bit lower of a score than this score. So I did better on the OA than I did on the PA. Um, but as you can see, it's kind of broken down by percentages. What well, portion of the assessment each of these topics will weigh on the final uh, score. And the majority of the assessment, almost 50%, comes from correlation and regression and probability. In my view, fractions, basic algebra, descriptive statistics, um, these should all be easy money. It doesn't make up really even half of the entire score, but s make sure you understand these things. It should be easy money, and it should just give you at least a baseline and a little bit of a buffer for the rest of these. I think descriptive statistics for two variables should also be kind of like easy money, but um, just make sure that you're confident in the in the basics. Um, if you're not confident with these, honestly, I, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket that you're going to do well on all of these. Um, not that most people can't, but it's, in my opinion, it's like why why study the harder stuff when you know you can get the easier stuff guaranteed, right? It's like, if you can get 100% on all four of these, then you only really need to do half as well on both of these combined. So you're giving yourself some buffer. Anyways, that's too much of that. What I really want to get down to is my approach, how long it took me uh, to get through this, and then some notes. Overall, I think I took 91 minutes on this objective assessment. Most of it was kind of double-checking my work. Like I said, I felt like the PA and OA aligned. The material was pretty dense, but I just pretty much watched cohort videos and then some Khan Academy videos. So I'll try to link those Khan Academy videos in the description. I'm a part of the WGU Accelerators group, and I think I kind of psyched myself out, mostly because... A lot of people in there were saying that the PA and OA didn't align, and it's very possible that there are different versions of this test that are given to people. I'm not sure, but I felt like mine aligned well. Okay, um, anything else that might be good just to know going in? If you took the PA and you passed, I think if you passed by a comfortable margin and you didn't need review in any of these areas, like if you were competent in these three areas, I would say probably go for it. If you need review in any of these areas, so if it's yellow in any of these three, I would say go back, double back, make sure you really understand these, watch out for keywords, and then go in and take the OA. Um, worst case scenario, you have to take it again, but I think it's a, a very important that you have a good understanding of keywords for these um, these topics here and then you can go in and just feel confident and knock it out okay so I think now uh, I gave everyone kind of what they needed for an overview of the assessment and I'm just gonna kind of go through some notes I apologize if this looks really weird on the screen having just kind of split screen um, 
I don't do a lot of editing and stuff, so I apologize in advance, but hopefully my narration will do good enough for you to understand what I'm what I've written down in my notes. <clears throat> so uh, module three starts out just kind of giving you basic algebra, kind of understanding the distributive property. You can see here if you understand the distributive property, you should be able to multiply with parentheses, parentheses and simplify equations. Um, a definition you want to know is a linear equation. Uh, that is an equation that represents two expressions on opposite sides of an equal sign and has the same value. So there's just an example there. Um, you don't need to know any of these definitions, but if you're reading a question and then it says like a linear equation, at least you'll know what that means. It's understanding what a linear equation is, I think will help you in your studies so that you're not getting confused like, oh, what's a linear equation? Um, here I just wrote down what the butterfly method was and it's just cross multiplying. So if you have an AX over B is equal to C over D, you would cross multiply to simplify that, which would be AX times D is equal to B times C. And then you would just simplify both sides of those equations. Sorry about that, I had a little cough. So something that's important that I think you'll want to understand is graphing. Graphing is really important. Sorry, another cough. Graphing is really important in this um, PA and OA. So you're going to definitely want to know what a slope is. The slope is just the rise over the run. And you can calculate that if you have two, <clears throat> two points on a graph. So you would just take y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that would give you the slope of the line that you were looking at. So you just determine what your x2 and y2 would be, and then what your x1 and y1 would be, and then you would just put that where it matters, and then that's how you get your slope. Another thing that's important that I can't stress enough is slope-intercept form, and that is y equals mx plus b. Anyone who's taken algebra in the past, so probably everyone who's at WGU, has probably seen this before. So this is just to... If you want to start graphing or you're looking at a graph and trying to determine whether it's the right graph from an equation, the m in this equation would be the slope, and that is again rise over run, and the b is the y-intercept, so that is where the line crosses the y-axis. Axis, my apologies. So if you're given an equation with um, an x and a y on opposite sides and the y has... Um, something that is being multiplied to it. You can simplify that equation by getting everything on one side and getting it in slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b. I'm not going to go too deep into that, just mostly because if you want to, you can look at these notes, or you can just look it up on Khan Academy. I would recommend Khan Academy to anyone. I am not very good at this, but I'm just trying to be at least a little helpful with my notes here. So, that is that. Okay, so next we have linear inequalities. So let's say you are um, on the test and you're given several different lines and points and you are supposed to determine which one is the correct one for any given equation. If you have an x is um, less than or equal to 7, you will want to draw yourself a little line and mark it with the appropriate dots. And some way that I think has been pretty helpful is that if you have the variable on the left side of your linear inequality, you can just put a line right through the greater than or less than sign and that'll be the direction that the line should point in. I know some people have had problems with that, so for example, in this one, it is x is less than or equal to 7, and so the line will be moving in the negative direction or away from 0, um, or towards 0, and then away from 0 after it gets past 0. 
and when there is a less than or equal to uh, or greater than or equal to you will fill in the point because it includes that 7 and anything below it. If it is just less than or greater than then there will be an open dot and it will be pointing in the same direction because it is not including the number on the opposite side of the variable. Something that's important when you're doing linear inequalities is that you will want to remember that if you are ever dividing by a negative number, you're going to flip the direction of the inequality. So if you have like 5 is uh, less than 2x, or negative 2x, and let's say that you have to get rid of that negative 2 to get the x by itself, you're going to divide by negative 2 on both sides. And this is not the example that I'm showing you, this is just talking out loud. If you divide that, you're going to want to flip the inequality. Um, sorry, the direction of the inequality to go the other way. So there's that. Um, this is, again, really important. I think it's pretty simple stuff once you get it down. Just remember, as long as you have the variable on the left side of the inequality, um, whatever direction the inequality is pointing just draw a line and you'll be like okay well now I know it's gonna go to the left or go to the right so as you can see here it'll go to the left because it's that's the way the arrow would go and again that's just how I remember it easy way to remember it okay um, so module four this is just knowing what mean, mean median mode and range are. So the mean is just an average of a set of numbers. The median is the middle of those numbers. And the mode is the most frequently occurring number in that set. Uh, the range is the difference between the smallest and the greatest values. So it's just maximum minus the minimum. And then if you are, now we get to quartiles. Um, quartiles are values that divide a value set into four equal size groups. So, quartiles. This is what you're going to be seeing, and I think it's called a box and whisker plot. So just imagine some tails going out to the side. Um, so, a quartile, you can remember like a quarter, it's something that's divided into four parts. There will be three quartiles that are separating those four parts. You have the bottom quarter, uh, the bottom half quarter, the top half quarter, and then the far right quarter. So there's that. Um, something that you're going to want to remember is interquartile range, and that measures the difference between the third quartile and the first quartile. So that's Q3 minus Q1. So if you're asked a question that asks for the interquartile range, just look at the box and whisker plot that you have. Take Q3, whatever that point is, and Q1. Subtract Q3 from Q1, and you have interquartile range. If you need to calculate outliers, uh, the way you would do that is some outliers that are smaller than like quartile 1 is going to be quartile 1 minus 1 1.5 times the interquartile range. That'll give you the smaller outliers, and the larger outliers will be taking Q3 and then adding that to 1.5 times interquartile range. And just remember order of operations. That's going to be one of the basic algebra things that you're going to be learning early on, but remember multiplication is going to come first in this situation. You're not going to subtract Q1 minus 1.5 and then multiply that by the IQR. You're going to want to make sure you multiply 1.5 times the interquartile range and then Q1, subtract, whatever you get from there. All right, standard deviation. So it's going to tell you, on average, how far data points are from the mean. So in a bell-shaped normal distribution, we would have, um, it would look something like this. It looks like a bell, as you can see. Or if you're listening, just imagine a bell-shaped that is symmetric. So on the left is the exact same as it is going to be on the right. So um, for standard deviation, there's a rule 
at 68% of the uh, data is going to be in the middle, 95% is going to be in the middle, 95%, 95% and 99.7% is going to be between uh, the third standard deviations of each other. Um, that was kind of a bad explanation of it, but just remember the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. So let me break it down a little bit more. 68% of the data is going to be between the one standard deviation above the mean and below the mean. 95% uh, of the data is going to be two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean. And then 99.7% of the data is going to be three standard deviations above the mean and three standard deviations below the mean. So in a question that you will probably get at some point in time, it's going to say there is x and x thing and the standard deviation, the mean is 1. And let's say the standard deviation is an average of 1 as well. So what you would do in that situation is draw yourself a little uh, graph where you have the mean in the middle, with which is 1, and then you're going to draw three standard deviations to the right, which would be 1, which is a mean, 2, which is one standard deviation away, 3, which is two standard deviations away, and 4, which is uh, three standard deviations away, and then you would do the same on the left side. And then you would just figure out, hey, 68% is between uh, negative one standard deviation and one standard deviation, and go on from there. So I, as you can see here, I have it broken down, the percentages and even what the standard deviation percentages are as well. Sorry if that's kind of a lot of word vomit, but it's kind of the best I can do right now. Okay, so five number summary. Okay, so this is for a box and a box plot. Uh, the five number summary is a list of minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum of a data set. So you can see this is a box plot, and it is a graphical display of the five number summary. So as you can see in the middle here, the box, you have a Q1, Q2, and Q3. And below Q1, you have 25%. Between Q1 and Q2, you have 25%. Between Q2 and Q3, you have 25%. And Q3 and the maximum, you have 25%. So it's going to be 100% of data that is within here, but every quartile is going to have 25% of the overall data which is important to remember because I think you're going to get questions that are going to try and throw you off and make uh, the box plot not evenly distributed. But you have to remember that in every quarter, there's just 25%. So if it asks you a question, and imagine that the box plot is very heavily distributed to the left, and... Uh, Q3 to the maximum looks a lot larger than 25%. Just remember that this is a box plot. 25% of the information of the data is in each quarter. So no matter how big they look, 25%. That's what you got to remember. Okay, so now graphical displays. Um, yeah, so for categorical variables, you're going to want to use pie charts when those are being represented. Um, you will also use bar charts when there are categorical variables that are being displayed. So pie charts will just display parts of a whole. Bar charts will display counts or frequencies. And quantitative variables. So um, when you're trying to just choose a graphical display for quantitative variables, you can choose a histogram, which displays distribution within a large data sets. Um, stem plots, which displays distribution and keeps individual data points. You can choose a dot plot, which is displaying distribution for smaller data sets. And box plots, which displays center, spread, and five number summary. And this is a box plot up here. It's important you're going to likely be asked questions about 
which graph to display information in a story problem, and you're going to have to determine whether the information you're given is categorical or quantitative, and from there, choose which graph. So just remember graphs. Okay, so module five. So ex explanatory variables and response variables. So an explanatory variable is a variable that claims to explain, predict, or affect the result. And a response variable is a variable that is obtained as a result. So if you want a visual representation of what that looks like, an explanatory, an explanatory variable will influence the response variable. And that's kind of what that looks like. That's how you can remember it. So uh, graphical displays for examining relationships between data. This is something you want to know. If you're given a word problem and it asks you to, to display what kind of graphical display to use, you will first want to categorize the data that you are given in the word problem. If it's categorical to categorical, um, you will use two-way frequency tables. So that's asking, like, let me think of two categories. Um, I think the one that they gave us is, like, smokers and um, lung cancer. Because those aren't quantitative um, variables, they are categorical. Like, you're just putting smokers in a category, and then you're also putting lung cancer in a category. You'd use a two-way frequency table to represent that. When you have categorical to quantitative, you'd use side-by-side -side blocks plots. And then if you have just quantitative to quantitative, you would use a scatter plot. And a scatter plot is just going to have a bunch of dots all over the place. Okay. Next. Okay, so graphical displays and numerical measures. So something to remember is that if you have quantitative to quantitative, um, data, you're going to use a scatter plot, and the numerical measure is a correlation coefficient. So imagine a scatter plot being something that's showing a bunch of data, and there's trying to determine a relationship for that data. So if it's negative relation or a positive correlation, um, you're going to want to choose a number that they're giving you between negative 1 and 1. Um, 0 is if there's no correlation, so if there's just dots all over the place. And again, I'm really sorry, I don't have a visual representation of this. Um, so you have to listen and then find some examples in the work to um, just kind of look at it, see a visual. But uh, like I said, scatter plot, you're going to be using correlation coefficient. Um, so for categorical to quantitative, you'll use a side-by-side -side box plot and five number summaries. And so that was what I was showing you in the past where you have a box plot and you have the quartiles. So Q1 through Q4 and then a median and you go from there. If you're given categorical to categorical, you'll use a two-way table and you will be using a conditional percentage. Okay, in the last page of my notes, module six is just sampling. Um, some things to know. Uh, there are four steps to collecting data. You're going to, one, uh, identify a question or a problem. Two, collect data. Three, analyze the data. And four, form a conclusion. And in sampling, there are three definitions you're going to want to know. Um, there's population, and the population is the group that we are interested in studying, so this is a representation of the population. Uh, sampling frame is a group we pull our sample from, so that's an example of a sampling frame. And then the sample is the subjects we are actually studying. Um, so there are some different sampling methods you're going to want to know. There's simple random, and that's when participants are randomly chosen from the population. There's a voluntary, um, that is where everyone in the sampling frame, so sampling frame, can participate, and subjects who respond to the request make up the sample. A stratified population is broken into groups, and some people from all groups are going to be selected. And a 
cluster is when the population is broken up into groups and all people from some groups are selected. So if you have five groups and you choose to only uh, sample two of them, you'll get those two groups and sample all of those people within those two groups. Okay, and uh, just you're going to want to know what bias is and be able to recognize bias in a word problem. So bias is when the method of collecting data causes the results to differ from what is true of the population. And I didn't really take notes on module seven. Um, I don't know why. I was just kind of following along with the word problems they were giving us. So unfortunately, I can't give any notes there. I hope that my notes were kind of useful. Hopefully you can maybe just like screenshot them or something and study them a little bit if it helps. This video is mostly just for people who are already taking the class and maybe need a little extra push to get some help. Um, I would like to do something where I can kind of break these down a little bit more and actually write down or kind of show you examples, but I just didn't really have time to. Um, yeah, just to wrap up, good luck. Uh, this class is definitely difficult. Like I said, it took me about a week to get through it of studying every single day. And if I can do it, you can do it. It takes some time. Just make sure you're studying probability, correlation, and regression. Make sure you really understand keywords in probability questions. And you should be good. I. It just takes time. That's That's the biggest thing I can say. I think a lot of people are so used to going through classes fast that when they get to a class that takes them maybe like two weeks they see it as kind of impossible just try to get out of that mindset um i know it's nice to be able to finish classes fast but there are going to be classes that will stop you a little bit and as long as you're focusing and just trying your hardest you'll do great and just remember that so thanks for watching the videos hopefully this was helpful and uh yeah, have a great day or night or wherever, whatever. Thanks for watching. Bye.